Mark, uh, we're good to go. We're good to go. Okay. Um, so welcome everyone to this session six of our um, of our workshop, which is really um, trying to stimulate some discussions and conversations off the back of our recovery with dignity project um, that we've been well, that's kind of coming to an end now. That's been running for the past um, past three or so years. This particular session focuses on um, narratives, which is a theme and a concept which has been central to the research that we've been pursuing in the project. Um, and the session itself is called Speaking Truth to Power. And I guess the title is a, is a very deliberate choice, um, as that saying is often held up as a way to bring the powerful to account. But I think through the research that we've done and certainly um, the work that our panelists have been involved in, I think we'll, we'll see and we'll hear that um, that often the powerful are able to kind of manipulate the truth to fit it um, to their own particular views about the world and their, their own specific agendas. And that's something that we'll be that we'll be discussing over the next hour and a half. Um, so my name is Mark Tebeth and I'm a, a lecturer at the University of East Anglia in Norwich in the United Kingdom. And I'm going to be chairing this session. Um, I'd also like to introduce um, Amberita, who's going to be working working in the background and ensuring things run smoothly. Um, and also, as you will be seeing in due course, we have uh, Lady Fingers, who are going to be making a graphical record of the session, which we'll be able to share later. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing. Um, so before. Before I move on, I'd just like to briefly draw your attention to the sessions tomorrow, which is the final day of the workshop. Um, and that really tries to explore the alternative pathways to this, uh, to recovery. Let me just pop, um, let me open up the chat. I'll just pop. So that's the um, that's the link to the workshop and then the, the agenda and all of the, the details about the the project and whatnot are on there. But we've got four sessions tomorrow. The first one focuses um, really on uh, recovery, but in terms of looking at people's pre-existing lives. So what happens before a disaster event and how does that influence recovery trajectories? Um, the second session focuses on the need to understand um, or how we can understand recovery in alternative ways. And that's particularly drawing on insights from the arts and humanities. The third session explores the different ways in which we can support communities to exert greater influence on their own recovery trajectories. And then finally, we have a, um, a wrap up session at the end of the day in which we can reimagine what recovery looks like and what that means. Um, so welcome you all wherever you are in the world. I know we've got a very international crowd for this, this workshop. I'm really pleased that you've uh, found the time to attend, whether that's in the morning, the afternoon, the evening, or in some cases, the middle of the night. Um, so before we move on, I'd just like to introduce our three panelists. Uh, so we've got Lisa Bornstein, who is an associate professor uh, with the School of Urban Planning at McGill University. Her areas of research include international planning, economic development, environmental policy and planning, institutions and governments, as well as international aid in South Africa, regional planning in Mozambique, and the metropolitan planning reform in South Africa. So really kind of uh, a huge range of um, expertise and experience to draw upon. So welcome, Lisa, very pleased, um, very pleased to have you on the panel. Um, we also have uh, Malini, and Malini is a faculty at Asimprenji University. And her research interests revolve around issues of religious identity, ethnicity, and political conflict, and the intersections emerging between um, religion and development. She started her career at the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, and subsequently worked in a conflict resolution firm where she was involved in conducting research on the Kandamel riots of 2008 in Odisha between Hindus and Christians. Um, 
And then finally, we have uh, Sibi Arasu. Uh, Sibi is an independent journalist who writes on environment, science and climate change. Um, he's the recipient of several awards in environmental journalism, including Red Ink Awards 2019, a special mention in the environment category, the Asian Environmental Journalism Awards in 2019, and the Prem Bhatia Environmental Journalism Awards in 2018 as well as the All India Environmental Journalism Awards in 2014. So uh, a very well decorated journalist. Um, so welcome, welcome to you all and you know my sincere gratitude for your, um, for your presence. And I'm very much looking forward to um, hearing your insights and you know, really getting your thoughts and opinions on, on some of the issues that we're going to be discussing. So uh, in terms of the, I, I guess, the, the panel itself, then we're going to, as I've said, be focusing on um, narratives, and that's particularly in the context of uh, recovery from disaster events. And we all know that they are, um, recovery is a highly unequal process, which is shaped by different social, political, cultural, and economic structures, often frame the capacities of affected people and the external support they receive. The recovery space, as Roger Few described yesterday when he was opening this workshop, is contested and political. Yet the recovery space is also an elongated and crucial phase for sustainable human development, and it has really deep and ongoing implications, especially for those simultaneously vulnerable to other crises, threats and inequities. And during the recovery phase, the ways in which disaster events and recovery are framed is often very influ influential. And it's therefore vital that attempts to support recovery and resilience in the aftermath of disasters, including um, COVID-19, which we're all experiencing at the moment, recognize not only the intersection of different risks faced by people, but also the way in which ideas and concepts used to describe, understand and respond to events in the aftermath can and do differ. And it's these issues that we're going to focus on today. Um, so I think just before we start, um, I think, uh, I'm not sure if you're able to, but uh, please can I ask you to keep your, your audio on mute. Um, and then I'm really hoping to stimulate some questions and these can be posed at any time in the chat um, or in the, the Q&A box. So please make sure when you're posting your question that you address it to the panelists and attendees if that's an option so everybody can see it. And I really hope um, in terms of the session itself, we're gonna have about, um, I don't know, about 50 minutes uh, of uh, discussion with the panelists and then a good chunk of time, 20 to 25 minutes, where we're hoping to get some really good questions from the kind of the virtual floor, if you like. Um, so uh, don't hold back with the questions, just keep them flooding in as we go. And then we'll kind of uh, try to respond to as many as possible um, in that in that second part of the of the session. And then the, the last bit, the final 10 minutes or so, I'll just come back to the panel to offer a few concluding remarks. So that's kind of it for the for how the session is going to run. Um, so now I think now if you like to the to the to the questions themselves. So just to, I guess provide an introduction, uh, really to the to the general ways in which um, the media and other actors frame events and processes following disasters and and what this really means for recovery. So how a disaster event itself is viewed and represented determines how different actors, whether that's um, national or international agencies, for example, can respond to it. And recovery, as I've said, is not a neutral term. It's political and it's contested. And this must be acknowledged with different actors possessing different visions of what recovery looks like and the best way to go about achieving it. In this contested space, how events and discussed, how events are discussed and portrayed, you know, is really very important. Um, for instance, disasters and responses are often conceived around a view of disasters as a single event, a rupture from the norm, rather than understanding places as locations of multiple disasters. And this is something that we've found in the, in the research project that we've done, Recovery with Dignity. Um, and similarly, <clears throat> we've also found that uh, 
you know, to focus on a specific example in the ways in which the South Indian floods were described by the media, policymakers, um, non-governmental organizations, as well as civil society organizations had real influence on people's understanding of causation. So initially, the role of nature, the intense nature of the rainfall was held as paramount as a one-off deluge, you know, and that was uh, held up to, to be driving all of the flooding. But subsequently, this was challenged as the role of urbanization, management of dams, etc., was revealed to have played a really important part in certainly exacerbating this flood event. And I think this example shows how different narratives, one of nature and the other of development or urban sprawl or mismanagement, can dominate how events are understood. And these issues are important because the attribution of understanding causation can then subsequently influence de decisions about the sorts of recovery interventions that are needed. Um, so my first question to the panel, after that slightly long-winded introduction, um, is how and in what ways do you see actors trying to shape understanding of disasters? And I guess with a particular focus on the impacts this can have for recovery processes. And I guess relatedly, which actors are influential in this space and are there any significant difference in the way these actors tend to frame and understand events? And I think I'll come to Malini first, if I may. Over to you, Malini. Thank you so much, Mark, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you for inviting me here. Uh, I've had the privilege of being associated with the project for a while now, not very actively though, but I've had the privilege of meeting you when you were in Bangalore. Uh, I think that was before the pandemic hit us. Um, I've been receiving periodic reading up about the project quite eagerly because a lot of it resonates quite directly with my own uh, PhD work, uh, which was also about disaster recovery and reconstruction, uh, incidentally. Uh, for today's panel, uh, I, I don't know if much of what I'm going to say is going to directly uh, answer what you have just raised right now, but I'm hoping it is of some relevance to the larger themes that you have raised right now, right? So, and I'm going to uh, be speaking specifically on the role of media uh, and how I think it impacts and why I think it's so important uh, to acknowledge the media as a very important stakeholder in disaster recovery, right? Uh, uh, and Sibi is of course here, I haven't had the chance to meet him and I'm not a journalist myself, but uh, I'll be very happy to hear what he has to say. But so this is largely from, uh, you know, a researcher's perspective and apologies in advance if I am completely off the mark, Siddhi. Uh, before getting into the meat of what I have to say, I, uh, I, I want to invoke philosophy because that's what primarily interests me around uh, social sciences. Uh, I think philosophy has the answers to uh, so many topical things that we write and speak about. Uh, and my, one of my favorite philosophers, John Locke, happens to have said something interesting about everything important under the sun, right? So it's not like John Locke begins with the conversation, uh, conversation around representationalism, but I think it's a very powerful idea to invoke, uh, particularly in a panel that's acknowledging media, right? So representationalism is an idea which many of you, I'm sure, are already familiar with, which uh, basically argues that uh, the perception that we have of the world around us, right, is, is not real. Uh, it's uh, basically a miniature uh, version of what actually exists out there, right? And John Locke was one of those philosophers who builds on this and has contributed enormously to this discourse. I don't want to get into the details here, but what strikes me as being so fascinating about this concept is that it's so relevant, right, when one is discussing the media today particularly with regard to how disasters are covered or how disasters are framed. Uh, in a pandemic like uh, COVID-19, uh, you know, the only way of perhaps knowing what's going on in the world is through the lens of the media, right? And I'm going to come to social media in a bit. And I've said this in the past that no matter uh, 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 how diverse media has become today, the fact remains that the first morning newspaper headline, right? The newspaper that I sit with when I'm sipping my cup of tea or coffee 
uh, is often the most important uh, source of information that I rely on to get a sense of what's going on around me, right? With, with regard to disasters in particular, things that are obviously extraordinary, I'm sure a lot of people sitting here would, would not be happy with my usage of the term extraordinary, but they are definitely out of the normal, right? These are things that happen to catch our attention and there is, there is an obvious interest around news that covers uh, uh, disasters. Why do I think media is so very important in, in this particular uh, process of framing disasters? It's because I feel like the media uh, is perhaps the first actor that's involved in discourse setting, right? Uh, uh, questions about how big is the disaster or how small is it? How, what is the scale like? How spectacular is it? Who is impacted the most? who are the most vulnerable, who are not so vulnerable, right? Who should be held accountable and who should not be held accountable? Uh, uh, questions regarding causation that Mark just pointed, to, pointed us towards, right? Whether these are acts of God or whether these are acts, whether disasters are an outcome of the failure of, of a particular state or a government. Uh, these are very early on uh, these frames uh, help set the discourse very early on, right? Much before the process of relief and recovery or re reconstruction even set in, right? So during the course of my own PhD work, I was primarily interested in looking at the role of a cultural group uh, called the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sang, which is a very political... I was interested in understanding the politics of mobilization that ensues through the process of recovery and reconstruction or even relief to begin with. But what I found very interesting when I actually dived into the field work is that this whole process of meaning making, the process of, polit of politicization actually begins much before the relief or the reconstruction period, right? It actually begins with how the media starts framing and citing different sources. Is it citing politicians who have a certain explanation about the disaster? Are they citing religious leaders or cultural groups who have a certain take or perspective on the event? Are they citing human rights activists there, right? So that in many ways, that, that very initial discourse setting has the tremendous influence on, you know, the amount of funds that, could post, that would potentially be raised, uh, the ways in which the more developed world uh, uh, is, is, is likely to respond to an event like that happening in perhaps a developing country. Uh, the ways in which perhaps, uh, uh, you know, processes of reconstruction and recovery are likely to be shaped uh, as questions as basic as, you know, what kind of houses uh, need to be rebuilt once the reconstruction process begin, which kind of partners should be brought in? Should these just be state actors? Should you know, civil society groups be involved? Should the World, get, World Bank get involved at all, right? These are questions that are, you know, start getting shaped very early on through the coverage of, of, of the ways in which disasters ha, uh, are framed, right, by, by different media. Uh, uh, now, thank God for small mercies that today we have something called social media, right? And you have Twitter and you have Facebook and COVID-19, of course, is a you know, perfect example of at least as far as India is concerned, where the government has been reporting in a certain way and, and you know, under-reporting is a better term to hear, hear you know, speak of here, whether it was under-reporting of deaths, whether it was under-reporting of, uh, you know, the number of infections that people were contracting. Uh, and, and, and for everything that the government was wanting us to believe, there was always this counter you know, number of uh, counter examples that one could possibly find on social media, right? Every second you could see images of, you know, whether these were dead bodies, uh, uh, you know, lined up outside a crematorium or dead bodies, you know, uh, uh, floating on the river uh, Ganga and so on and so forth. Uh, what's also very important to acknowledge is that it's not always that, uh, you know, the media is uh, uh, holding the, the, those in power to, uh, to account, right? Uh, in my research on Gujarat, for instance, uh, uh, and that was the time, of course, when Gujarat was seen as this model developmental state, 
uh, I think a, a, a lot has uh, a lot of those myths have been broken much later on. But at the time in which I was collecting my data, uh, there was this celebratory account, right, about how well the state government had handled the reconstruction process. Uh, it's not like uh, uh, nothing good happened on the ground. Uh, when I was doing my field work, field work, of course, there was, you know, a groundswell of appreciation from several dominant groups of beneficiaries who had obviously benefited from these reconstruction projects. But there were also other kinds of people, right? There were other beneficiaries like Dalits, like Muslims and uh, uh, other minority groups in particular who had not had a similar experience of the state, right? And it just takes one to scratch the surface a little bit in order to understand that these celebratory accounts that the media would like us to believe is far from the truth. Well, it's not the complete picture, if not, you know, uh, not entirely something that's misleading. Uh, uh, so that's one. And the other two things that I would, uh, can I go on, uh, Mark, or should I come back to some of these points later? Um, I think if, if it's okay, um, uh, Mark, maybe... can I go on for two more minutes? Is that all right? Uh, yeah, a couple more minutes is fine. Or should I? Can or I could me? come back after a few others have spoken, perhaps. Um, well, I, I'll tell you what. All right. Um, okay. So I'll just quickly finish what I have. Yeah. Yeah. Go on. Okay, all yeah, right. Two minutes, huh? Sure, yeah. So the other thing that I wanted to also highlight is, you know how, uh, I think the media always wants us to believe that, you know, the, the whole business of news is not based on, uh, uh, you know, sort of normative criterion, right? And that one has to take into account the scale of the disaster, you know, how big is it, how spectacular it, it is, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but there's, there's this very interesting report that I'm sure many of us have come through, which is called the Karma Report, right? The CARMA Karma Report, which actually looks at five disasters across the world, uh, across different locations. And one of the central findings of that report actually is that scale really does not matter, right? What actually matters is how the global media uh, envisages a particular event based on, uh, you know, certain frames and discourses that they are more comfortable with, right? Uh, so, for example, the global media, like we all know, is, is populated largely by, you know, uh, white men, mostly from the developed world, who have a certain, uh, 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 you know, agenda or discourse that they are more comfortable with. Right, and, and that obviously plays a huge role in the ways in which a disaster like, let's say, Haiti is, is envisaged. Uh, so I'll stop here and I'll return to probably some of the other things that I wanted to say once I hear from the others. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Malini. Um, and I think uh, if I could just ask for some brief uh, reflections. If you'd like to build on anything that Malini has said, I'll, I'll come to you first, Sibi, and then over to you, Lisa. Okay. Hi. Thanks for having me here, and uh, it's uh, lovely to be part of this session with, with so many researchers and experts in this field. It's going to be a great learning experience for me, for sure. Uh, it was lovely to hear what Malni was talking about and, uh, you know, her experience through her work. Uh, there just a few quick points. Yeah, I, I largely agree with how she, is, uh, she framed the conversation. Just something that I thought, uh, as somebody who's, uh, 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 I'm surely not at the center of the media industry, but as somebody who has been part of this industry here in India for like uh, more than a decade now and experience how things work in both mainstream newsrooms as well as an independent journalist, which is what I am now. I can definitely say that uh, one thing when it comes to shaping understanding and uh, many of the things I say now, uh, even though they're pertinent to disasters, they are not limited to it. It's to shape any understanding of any issue really, I feel. is uh, There's no one overarching, you know, media perspective anymore at all whether it was ever there i'm not sure like 
I find that well, among the people I have worked with, among the gatekeepers, so to speak, that I have personally interacted with in the media, like their agenda is driven by multiple factors, and many a times, uh, um, journalism, quote unquote, pure journalism, and the need to expose information to the public or to carry forward information is not really their primary concern. Like whenever it comes to any major event, like you know, there are certain agendas that any media organization, be it the most independent or be it the largest corporate behemoth, they seem to have. And these agendas are what drives their news coverage. The, the day after the disaster, the large events, news might be similar across the board. But if you notice, even by the afternoon or even by the next day, the third day, the coverage of that particular event changes drastically depending on which media you follow or which echo chamber you are part of. That is uh, something that I've noticed in my experience as, as a journalist as well as a consumer of media. And um, if, like I just wanted to also say, even with the pandemic, uh, for example, the agenda is being set not so much by those within the media enterprise, but more so by those who hold the, you know, like... Uh, various, maybe the purse strings or maybe like the policy strings and so on and so forth. They play an extremely key role in setting the agenda as to how things are covered. So yeah, that is another thing I wanted to highlight. Thanks. Super. Thanks. Um, thanks very much, Sibi. And uh, over to you, Lisa. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, for allowing me to participate. I'm sure I will learn a tremendous amount and I'm uh, very appreciative of my co-panelists who are much more knowledgeable about media, media representations than I am since uh, most of my focus in my work is on narratives and representations that are advanced by the state or by uh, uh, international organizations and the counter narratives um, that are emerging from local residents, ordinary people. Um, so, so that it, media may be implicated, but it has never been a, a central, well, barely been a central focus of the work that I've done. So just a couple responses and additions. Um, when I look at questions of representation, discursive analysis, attention to language, part of my concern is about how those framings of the world allow certain, certain dynamics and relationships and aspects of people or the world and the environment to surface and come, it's, it's as if the light is focused on them the same way as we're, we're having ourselves spotlighted here. So they become very, very visible, tangible, and other dynamics and people and conditions and environments become less or almost invisible. And this kind of dynamic of how we frame things and how those who are powerful, like actors within the state, and especially in states that are have people who are trying to consolidate power or gain more power um, get translated and transmitted in the form of um, institutions, laws, norms, rules of the game. And so these representational and discursive debates and narrative debates have very, very material outcomes. And it's, it's one of the reasons why they're so important and why how the state or media frames these can have long-term implications. And um, please don't take this as a critique, Malini, but this is, this is one example of how we might illustrate this is in terms of the idea of a disaster. So the idea that media or the state will focus on the sensational, the exceptional event, the one in which there are a number of deaths, uh, loss of lives that can be quantified and counted and reported, uh, the damage in economic terms. Why is that considered a disaster? 
but the kinds of structural violence that people suffer from and encounter on a daily basis that is the outcome of all sorts of historical inequalities, why is that not a disaster worthy of coverage or of framing as a disaster? And yet that is the way in which representational dynamics work. That word and that language has been framed to mean certain things and others have been excluded. And so um, I find it really, really interesting what we don't look at ourselves, what we, and we need to, because we need to communicate. So we need to have norms about what things mean and what's in focus and what's not. But one of the challenges in trying to look at counter narratives or to question the dominance and the role of narratives is to, 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 to be reflective about it and be critical about it. And, and so, so that's one set of points. The other point is that, yes, we can look at representational and discursive um, dynamics in general, but disasters are really interesting. Uh, disaster events are moments in which um, we might find that uh, governance failures come into, in, into focus the dam collapses that was sanctioned and supported by and built by whomever and you know, blame should be apportioned. But just as often, and this is a point I think you were making, Mark, is that in the struggles to consolidate power, disasters are fodder. They're, they're, they're a moment in which, which the rules of the game could be def redefined and in which um, the discursive becomes one of those realms in which those struggles occur. And um, so my suspicion is that what's happening in the media or what's happening with the people who are most affected is maybe as important as, maybe much less important than the kind of beside behind the scenes struggles over power that are taking place in a political realm. Um, and so really, really interesting moments for us to look at how this discursive um, set of challenges and representation, representational framings work out both within and outside of the state, um, specifically in, the, in, in media. So I'll close there for now. Super. Thanks. Um, thanks all very much. And I think, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think what uh, looking at these representational aspects does, it almost provides a window through which we can look at these often occluded, uh, occluded issues related to power, which remain, which remain hidden. And I think you've all alluded to that uh, in one way or another. And I think one thing just, uh, just to pick up upon, I think in, uh, Lisa, when you were talking about um, why say certain things become a disaster, um, one of my colleagues at UEA is constantly tweeting, um, why is it that we have a daily death count for COVID, but we don't say have a daily death count for poverty, for instance, and then, you know, what would, what would it look like if we did have uh, every day the media was reporting X number of people were dying through poverty, and I mean, you can apply the same argument, I think, to lots of different um, lots of different issues. Okay, I'd like us to um, switch our attention now, if we may, to um, disaster affected people or populations. Um, so I think we've been talking more generally now. I'd just like to focus in a little bit now. Um, and you know, and when uh, in reporting on and responding to disaster events and their aftermath, we often see that disaster affected populations experiences feature prominently, um, not just in the media, but you know, you know, they're often writ large in how people talk about disaster events, but they're largely devoid of any analysis of the underlying causes and conditions that lead to the disaster. And I think this, this again, picks up on some of the points that you've all been making. And while it normalizes the survivor's trauma for audiences over time. Um, and often the portrayals of survivors are done through a lens of victimhood as suffering as the focus. Um, and in our research that, that we've been undertaking, we see evidence that disaster affected populations are also 
portrayed as beneficiaries of services as needy people and in some cases duplicitous they're claiming more than they're entitled to and underpinning many of these views um, is one which sees disaster affected populations as victims now unsurprisingly this is not the view that is shared by those who are directly impacted by disasters. So in our interactions in Arissa, in Kerala, in Tamil Nadu, I think people directly impacted by disasters perceive themselves as far from victims. They regarded the support and recovery measures that they receive following disasters as an obligation that the state should provide. But I mean, in spite of this, that the level of support was often inadequate and similarly, they rejected the framing that was common in the media of them as victims unable to help themselves and they often talked about the resilience that they'd shown or you know the support that they would received from friends and family from their community as they sought to recover um as they sought to recover from the different uh, disaster or hazard events that had affected them so i think uh, and this directed um directed to you lisa first and then we'll come to um sibi and malini but those affected by disasters often get portrayed in specific ways by the government by the media and by other actors you know people are often shown as maybe being highly vulnerable and experiencing trauma um similarly they they can be shown to be highly resilient but they're rarely called upon as experts in their own own light so um how do you think that people that are typically marginalized um, from decision making process from um, being able to exert influence on narratives on the media, for instance, um, can exert greater agency over the ways in which they are represented. And I guess more, more generally, uh, do you think this is important? And if so, why? Over to you, Lisa. Thank you, Mark. There's lots of material in there, so I'm not quite sure where I'm going to start. I think I'm going to, I'll start more with the second question, and then I'll come to the how-to afterwards. Um, and um, so building off what I was just talking about, to the extent that state media, other powerful actors are trying to frame um, disaster events as moments where they can act, they tend to define problems in very, very technical ways, in ways that are amenable to state interventions, outside interventions. Um, and in the process, um, to the extent that they consider uh, local affected people, they are often portrayed in ways that will uh, justify interventions. And that entails, in many cases, drawing on um, existing well-known biases, stereotypes, tropes of victimhood, of uh, ignorance, of lawlessness, of uh, uh, venality, of all sorts of negative images that then get reproduced and can justify certain types of interventions. Um, they're not sufficiently risk averse. Why are they there in the first place? Why won't they move? Um, you know, what's going on? And so, so that kind of perpetuation of um, highly questionable uh, ways of portraying people is something that occurs. Um, I've been involved in a parallel research project uh, for the last four years in Latin America and the Caribbean. And we've been working with local partners, universities, NGOs, community leaders, and residents um, in, around 22 micro initiatives that deal with climate change adaptation, disaster risk reduction, and um, uh, recovery or development change. Um, and, and so we've really had an opportunity to, to look at how do they divine um, all of these different representational uh, uh, representations of, of these themes of risks and disasters? And are they in parallel to what uh, states and media are portraying or are they different? And just a couple quick examples. Um, so Cuba, coastal area, um, people, are being asked by the government, more than asked, to relocate because it's an area that is uh, subject to 
more intense storms, sea level rise is affecting it, there's periodic flooding. And for the good of the people, they should move, right? And that, that's both the individuals, but also state expenses and everything else. Um, and uh, local people say, well, wait a second, you know, what, what, it's not, it's not the sea that hurts me. That's my livelihood. People hurt me. And so they immediately bring in questions of justice, relationships as a central focus. Um, for them, questions, and this is in Cuba, questions of, of, of climate change adaptation, risk reduction are intimately linked to questions of environmental, economic, and social justice. Their understanding of risk is of what happens tomorrow in terms of food, medication, shoes for my kids to go to school. Um, their risks are, if I relocate, will I have a livelihood? Will I still have connections to the social relations that give my life meaning? Will I have connections to the places that have meaning for me? And so there's a lot of uncertainty, but it's not the uncertainty that the climate experts focus on of how intense will the storms be? It's the uncertainty of uprooting themselves and relocating to an apartment building 15 kilometers away from the, the, the shore. Um, so, you know, just using the same example, um, there are avenues for change. Um, so in our work, um, and, and I've got multiple examples, what we found is that when we tapped in and when local groups tapped into culturally relevant activities, and that could be a local festival, it could be playing soccer, it could be pottery, it could be dance, um, things that had meaning and could link them into the initiatives around climate change awareness, risk reduction, recovery, then it had more meaning to people. And it also provided opportunities for new types of social relations to emerge, for momentum to be sustained, um, and for the process to become lighter in some way, or create the space for different kinds of emotional content. So, um, often the, the development and disaster experts assume one emotion, and that's fear. And that fear of the hazard is the dominant impetus for change. But what people from, from these different areas were revealing and what our, our partners revealed is that all sorts of emotional and effective aspects of life are implicated. And that means joys and friendships and fears and hopes and um, all sorts of things. And that creating space for those was really, really important and validating and, and almost bringing an emotional lens to what we were doing was really important, whether that was around dealing with psychosocial traumas and, and healing processes, but also just other kinds. I mean, play is important. Laughter is important. And so creating a space for that was something that was crucial. So was stretching out. So for example, in documenting people's own stories and perspectives and then sharing them and working with local government in Cuba, in Chile, we found that government was creating new ways of interacting with and understanding local residents. And so the plan for the municipality, this coastal municipality now has a very, very different approach and acknowledges that people want to stay and don't necessarily have to move. Um, in Chile around a pottery workshop, 
design, I should also say, design was often a way of, of focusing joint activities and providing something that wasn't just about the interpersonal, but another object that, that could provide a less problematic um, template for learning how to work together and understand each other. Um, but in Chile, which is just in a, a political upheaval and there's all sorts of interesting openings occurring in a new constitution, little project of joint design of pottery workplaces that entailed conversations with these potters, the academics as intermediaries, government is being looked at nationwide as a new way of interacting um, between the, the government and civil society. Um, media doesn't know anything about this. That's not what they cover. They're covering, you know, big dramatic things. But these are really important ways of moving forward. Um, academics have a role in creating spaces. Um, we can talk more about that. Um, but uh, I'll stop there. I have, I have tons of material, so it's very, very hard to keep it short, but I will try. That was, uh, that was really interesting. Thank you very much, um, Lisa. And I think the, uh, certainly for me, the, you know, when you're alluding to the more, I guess, the creative approaches of engaging communities, that's certainly something that resonated with me and that we've been trying to pursue or that's been kind of COVID curtailed in, in this project. But I don't want to, don't want to take up too, too much time with my wittering on so I shall move um, over to uh, Sibi now and then I'll come to Malini for some uh, uh, thoughts or, or reactions to what, what Lisa has said. Thanks Mark. Uh, thanks Lisa for that. It was really quite eye-opening. Um, so my two bits on this I would say like I've covered a few disasters in South Asia over the years the Nepal earthquake or the floods in Tamil Nadu, or the cloud burst in the Himalayas, and so on. And I like my personal experience has been that I've noticed that when on the ground, when those affected by the disaster also includes the so-called decision-making classes, uh, then the reactions to it and the response to the disasters are uh, a more swift and b also more well thought out is what I've noticed. And uh, when the disaster largely affects a disempowered community or like the large portion of people affected includes the an already disempowered community or the working classes of whichever region that the disaster has happened in, then um, I had noticed that the reactions to the disaster is the, the kind of um, difference in perspective between those affected and the uh, those are administering changes to uh, tackle the fallout of the disaster is like very stark when this is the situation. Um, and uh, one more thing I want to say is that uh, it matters a great deal, I think, what people affected by disasters feel. And through my reporting, I've tried to highlight voices of affected people, like their perspective on the disaster. And even in conversations, I've noticed the reasons they feel this disaster happens many a times is very different from why, say, administrators or uh, people in positions of power feel the tragedy has been so enormous in many cases. And I, I also think it matters a lot right now in the global south, especially because there's a lot of uh, money behind and a lot of funding in sustainability, resilience to climate change. And, you know, like uh, there's a lot of projects that are funded primarily through government channels. And it's extremely important who decides and what perspectives are taken into account when these resilience projects or various large ticket funding is invested on the ground, what it is invested for. So I think that's where their perspective comes in, uh, crucial. Okay, thanks, thanks, Sibi, and some really, um, really nice insights there. I guess drawing on your drawing on your journalist experience, and I, yeah, I agree that it does matter most, um, most definitely. Um, right, Malini, over to you. Thanks, thanks uh, for everything that you've said. Uh, I found this last bit really interesting, especially what Lisa said about 
uh, you know, finding out of the box, more creative ways of looking at recovery processes. And what, what, what we often forget is that, you know, human beings are at the end of the day, emotional beings and social beings, right? And perhaps a strictly bureaucratic, legal, rational, secular lens does not always work. Uh, uh, when planning for uh, recovery and reconstruction, drawing from my own work again. You know, this is again, um, not an easy question to negotiate because Gujarat has also been infamously known for, you know, it's exclusionary politics. But some of the villages that I had visited, I, I clearly remember that the entire process of reconstruction was also a space when, when culture became a very important institution, right? Uh, so a lot of people who were the direct beneficiaries of, of these uh, reconstruction projects, you know, claim that the entire process was cathartic because for the first time in their village, uh, they had been able to construct a goshala, which is a cow shed, right? Now, that obviously has Hindu nationalist overtones. And I realized the problem of, you know, advocating for something like that uh, without applying the without sort of declaring the obvious uh, problems associated with a position like that. But I would, at the same time, I, I would still like to stick out my neck and argue for why I think cultural groups and religious groups in particular, in particularly in contexts like South Asia, I think have a very interesting role to play uh, because they clearly stand outside of that legal, rational, bureaucratic, trajectory that state governments often use, right? And, and that often does not work. Uh, so probably the, the challenge is to find a way to negotiate these, uh, the role of these stakeholders without the vocabulary becoming too exclusionary, uh, but at the same time, finding space to accommodate some of these things. Because like I said, disasters often become sites for uh, you know, very deeply emotional reflections, right? Uh, you know, something as basic as organizing prayer meetings, for instance, um, memorializing the disaster by, you know, just sitting in a temple premise or maybe outside a mosque together, uh, you know, can also be a very important part in, in, in the process of recovery. So yeah, I'll stop there. Super, thank, thank you very much. Um... Malini, and I think, um, <clears throat> I mean, you know, in referencing cultural groups, I think one of the things that we found um, within the project is that, that, if you like, the cultural infrastructure that, and I don't mean hard infrastructure um, uh, necessarily, that exists within a community that can be disrupted um, during a disaster is something which is often neglected by state agencies. So I think trying to just bring in this perspective to at least get that recognized and to support recovery initiatives which seek to kind of rebuild um, the, the cultural things which communities value I think is very very important so yeah a well made point there um, and I think it's moving on now to that um, I guess the provision of recovery that I'd like to um, to turn our attention to now and I think this is um you know, this is something that uh, Sibi highlighted just now and when he was talking about um, when the decision making classes are affected by disaster, then the recovery provision tends to happen maybe a bit more, a bit more quickly. And it's something that, that Lisa Molini, you've also alluded to. Um, but what uh, I guess what I'd like to. By kind of the framing, if, if you like, is that we need to recognize that um, disasters affect people unequally and whether that's based on geography or socioeconomy or politics or cultural or other characteristics and you know that's that's well established um and relief and aid is often also targeted towards those considered to be the most impacted um but to be targeted at those who are most impacted that requires them to be visible and i think often you'll see um that the less visible people tend to fall between the cracks and that's not just in terms of immediate relief, but also in relation to longer term recovery processes. Um, but, you know, knowing well that poor development is deeply intertwined with risk causing factors and that the most vulnerable of these affected populations are also implicitly um, becoming often the least desirable targets for recovery agents or risk reduction pra practitioners. 
um, creates problems. So who gets aid or post-disaster recovery support is often ascertained by who is seen as good, you know, a passive and grateful recipient of aid, or bad, and those who maybe don't conform to notions of what a victim should be or what a victim looks like. And these categories are often observed by, you know, and determined through historical relationships, through structural inequities, um, through the way that power falls within societies. And in the period, you know, following the tsunami or following Gadja, certain groups were identified as being primarily affected, so whether that's fishers or farmers, whereas other groups were a lot less visible. So, for instance, landless labourers. So these, um, <clears throat> you know, this really impacts this kind of understanding of who's impacted and who isn't, who needs support and who doesn't, um, you know, is influenced, yes, by the disaster, by the hazard, but also has very strong structural um, structural precedent, if you like. And I'd just like the, the panel to reflect on the extent to which the media and other actors are complicit in perpetuating the certain ways of seeing and knowing a disaster event and people and how this matters. And I guess how this also could be disrupted and in what ways could the, the media, for instance, or, or other actors um, reporting on periods following disasters be improved um, to try and ensure that there's better recognition um, of some of the, the inadequacies or of the need to improve recovery provision measures. And I'll come, uh, I'll come to you first, Sibi, and then uh, Malini, I'll come to you and then, then to Lisa. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I, I thought it'll make more sense again to draw on my experience as a journalist because that might be a perspective that might benefit everyone here. So I think like, it's interesting to mention the Gaja cyclone because you know that is one region which has been repeatedly affected by disasters and there are communities there who have been completely ignored by relief measures, like you're saying landless laborers as well as indigenous communities which are found only in that region who have been completely ignored. Um, coming to the larger question, I think the media, even though I'm a part of the larger media landscape, I think definitely we are we are quite complicit in, you know, like the, what is going on. And most media houses blame the government whenever there's a disaster, but uh, there is little follow-up work. In fact, uh, when I was working with the IIHS earlier this year, uh, they have, we had prepared a handbook for reporting on climate change along with the Word Lab. And uh, some of my colleagues have also looked at a few uh, coverage of disasters in a few Indian newspapers and media websites. And they also found that media coverage is really lacking when it comes to disasters. There's no nuance. Really. And um, as a journalist who's been covering climate change and environment uh, over the last years, at least now, it is only recently, I'd say in the last three or four years, that I've found space in the mainstream media for these issues. For example, like... Uh, uh, you know, uh, mainstream media organizations are hiring environment reporters as a beat, while earlier it will just be a additional task for whoever's covering the science beats and the, and the primary and the, the more celebrity beats used to be crime politics. And uh, earlier this coverage was also only around when, say, a cop happens or a big disaster happens, and the news cycle would probably last for a week or two. And uh, it would literally disappear out of uh, not only the front pages, but any kind of coverage on the issue would just abruptly stop multiple times. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, various analysis of media coverage of climate change in India, especially, has proved the same. There have been studies which are done, I'm sure you guys are familiar with, where there's peaks in coverage during co-ops or disasters, and that's, then there's nothing really. And uh, I think there's a big issue in understanding the causality of disasters among journalists and editors. And uh, there's also a big problem with how environmental issues are understood by editors. I have personally faced editors where I've proposed, or I know of colleagues who propose stories on say coastal regulation zones uh, to you know, manage construction along India's coastlines or environmental impact assessments to say uh, report on these things are considered by many editors even today as being anti-development, quote-unquote. And uh, they have actually discouraged journalists 
me included and i've heard of other journalists also from pursuing these issues because they believe this is just like a environment activist lobby who are perpetuating this and there's no discussion on even pursuing the story seeing where it leads to uh this is still i'm, I'm sure the dominant perspective like i said among many editors uh an interesting change that has happened post pandemic is that the health reporters used to be on the same boat as us pre pandemic but now suddenly everybody is waking up to how important health is it was considered a soft beat so to speak before the pandemic but now everybody is an expert right like and uh, a good this is a a silver lining i guess ever so thin of the pandemic that health gets a lot of priority coverage a lot of data journalists a lot of editorial people who lo- are looking into it and these people affect the general agenda of any media organization as well and uh, i also think disasters and their fallout are sensationalized especially in tv and broadcast media but there's little prolonged coverage of the long term long term fallout of disasters let alone slow onset disasters like water crisis so on those receive next to no attention uh, uh for me i cover the chennai floods and i i am from chennai so i uh, during that experience in 2000 or rather i should say tamil nadu floods during that experience what i found was that uh, it everybody acknowledged that the city and that the state is coastal region extremely vulnerable to climate change related events but uh, even though people's houses literally sank like once the water receded everybody went back to business as usual and like lake regions which were like you know it was highlighted that the airport is built on a lake that's why it drowned that's why it was flooded so badly etc lot of the up and coming you know say, uh, suburban regions it was highlighted that construction should not be a strict no no in these regions but you go to that city now and these exact regions are seeing large scale infrastructure being developed and the airport is standing exactly where it is like 5 years ago and the media too while everyone is cognizant of these issues there's hardly any long term pressure applied or media campaigns that are raised questioning the authorities about why they are perpetuating these kind of you know infrastructure or other developments which we have already seen has caused so much you know hard burn and damage and disaster and loss um and even like say smart city programs or like i said resilience funding is they done in very piecemeal manner so literally there'll be like a small stretch which is declared as resilient while like the edge of that stretch would be prone to even the smallest you know, rainfall that affects the city or region and uh, i think the issue is systemic and is not just restricted to the environment and climate change coverage in the media there is hardly any time for any journalist to understand any issue that they cover properly apart from the uh, primary issues that uh, such as uh, primary so called primary issues like politics crime etc where journalists are given freedom to get background educate themselves and make sources but these so that is a big issue there need to be a lot more refresher courses a lot more training for journalists with people such as yourself so that they get a you know like a intuitive understanding of how to approach the next disaster when it happens um, i don't know how much room is there but uh, if this kind of movement happens if the, if this kind of inter- intervention is made i think that will definitely help improve future coverage of disasters which are sure to happen thanks thanks uh, thanks very much uh, sibi and i'd also say i don't think it should just be us that's doing training of journalists i think you would be exceptionally well placed yourself to offer up some uh, some super valuable insights for them but i think you made you, you know you made a range of a uh, range of really good points and i thought um one of the things that uh, was picked up on in a, in a discussion in a previous session was around the I guess the structural barriers that in your case journalists facing trying to report on issues or lacking the knowledge or the time and these I guess are systemic issues which are affecting kind of journalism as a as a kind of a practice and trying to to challenge some of those uh, I think would be very well it's kind of looking at how I guess we can change reporting or try influence reporting recognizing some of those structural constraints that that the 
that journalism faces. Okay, um, Malini. Mark, can I come back in a minute because my internet is a bit unstable and there's a lag. So is it all right if Lisa goes first? Lisa? Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to see if I can fix this. Sure, um, though I really do defer to the two of you around media analysis since uh, you know far more than I do. Um, so just, you know, thank you very, very much. I found your comments to be very, very interesting and um, insightful. Um, so I, I, mine are more questions. So, um, you know, how independent is the media? Um, one of my students did some work in the Bahamas, a small island state. And what she found is that there was that, that lack of capacity that you just mentioned was just the reality. So that the only things that they would report on would be the gazetting of a new program or the disaster uh, uh, casualty figures or loss of buildings that the government gave them. And there was none of the, as you mentioned, none of the slow onset type of uh, analyses and no follow up after the, the fact to look at, did those programs actually get implemented? Did you, so, and they all had exactly the same language because it was all straight from whatever the government published. Um, and and so, so one question is just about, about how independent, how much does that vary from place to place? What's the culture of journalism and the resources available for independent um, and independent research and on the ground reporting in different parts of the world? Because um, I suspect, and again, I'm, I'm quite ignorant about this, um, that it varies greatly. Um, the second part is, well, who's stepping into the void? So Malini, I'm very curious, you mentioned that you could talk a little bit about social media, but um, I mean, it, it, I think we've been seeing over the last decade, the rise of all sorts of disinformation, outright falsehoods, um, uh, avid believers in different ways of framing reality that are being fostered uh, either intentionally or less so through social media networks and through the sort of analytics and, and uh, uh, ways in which social media operates and keeps its audiences and spreads it. Um, and so, again, I don't know much, but you know, it's not just academic experts, scientists who are propagating certain language and representations, but we have this other realm that is not just reproducing, um, that is not just taking the language and frames that have been dominant and have been controlled, but we now have this plethora of, of narratives that you know, people, people are having trouble. Um, yes, we're speaking, speaking something to power, but does it resemble anything like truth? I have no idea. So Melina, I hope you're, you're able to, to, to contribute now because uh, I don't have any answers. Lots of questions. You want to go first, Mark? Uh, only, to, only to invite you to talk, Malini. <laughs> No, I was thinking you may have something to say after Lisa's fascinating questions. I, I really enjoyed both your comments, actually. And, and particularly, I'll, I'll begin with what you had to say about social media. I cannot agree more with you. Uh, of course, uh, you know, you're absolutely right that if there were lesser evils to choose from, now you have so many different versions of truth and untruth. I don't know. I think it's made our life much more difficult. But the larger point of why I had brought up social media was to, was to uh, implicitly advocate for the idea that I think that, that this democratization is helpful to some extent. It's helpful to the extent that for every um, frame out there, there is now a counter narrative uh, and, and the truth is perhaps somewhere in between. Uh, so the very fact that people have access to uh, challenge these meta narratives that exist, I think is a good entry point uh, 
and a, and and a step in the right direction uh, having said that i completely acknowledge uh, your anxiety of of you know the confusion that social media has also added to our our lives right uh, i i'm just recalling um, you know a particular uh, episode uh, in that happened around uh, two and a half years ago when the kerala floods had happened in 2018 right and Uh, so some of my students were uh, doing some fundraising. These were students from Kerala, and uh, the fundraising event actually went quite well. It wasn't an event even, but with a series of sort of collection drives, and it went quite well. And I remember uh, four or five students coming up to me who were from Assam, and because I I was born and raised there, they perhaps felt like they could confide to me, and they came and said. while we are happy about the fundraising drive you know what we are really disappointed with is that you know we have similar you know scale of floods every year in assam right but none of this gets reported in the media and um, i had to tell them well the cruel truth is that floods happen in assam every year it's repetitive and it's obviously boring for the media right but what you can do as as you know concerned citizens is to write and to talk about it i think there's a way in which we give too much agency to the media i think with the birth of the internet not just social media you know there's so much that one can do you know whether it's just coming up with one's own blog or you know i don't know just posting on discussion forum uh, on the dis- on a multiplicity of discussion fora for that matter you know uh, i think the onus is very much on us uh, scholars uh, concerned citizens journalists like to be i mean uh, i don't think there are any gatekeepers out there in the internet who who prohibit us from giving them our version of the truth uh, and i sincerely believe that as academics as people who would like to advance the debate around disaster recovery there is a need to go to those places where the camera hasn't gone so far right and even looking at disasters from new perspectives from new lenses instead of just you know taking things for granted uh when i decided to you know pick on two disasters that i wanted to study for my phd uh you know the choice was driven largely by you know scale right the scale of destruction the scale of death but like lisa rightly pointed out you know i mean i i don't even know now looking back in hindsight if that was the right decision to do i mean so what if people are not dying there are other forms of structural violence that are equally important right and there could be other forms of disaster that that are hidden that are concealed uh, that are not you know making it to history textbooks or to newspaper headlines uh, i think there is a need for us to you know go there uh, uh, and you know sort of unravel some of these uh, uh, stories that have not been told so far yeah so i think while the media continues to be so dominant and so powerful i think uh, there is a lot of hope there that and and one has to take the onus pretty much on one own self yeah that was uh that was wonderful thank you very much melini and i yeah uh it's nice um I was thinking actually when you were I guess putting the onus uh more on all of us to to get out there and and kind of try and t- take a bit more ownership of things I was thinking that's just um you know that's often what we what we advocate in relation to to other to other groups to other people um so I think it's nice to have that light shown shown back on us to uh to get us to to work a bit harder or do a bit more or to to try and uh tackle some of the issues in a in a more i guess engaged and practical way um so thanks yeah thanks for that and thanks sibi and lisa for your for your interventions as well so we've got now about uh, probably about 15 20 minutes left and we've got three questions in our q and a box so um <coughs> what uh So I think handily there's probably a question uh well there's a question directed at Lisa or a question directed at Sibby and then a question in relation to social media which I might uh direct to you Melini if that's um 
that's okay but we'll we'll take them we'll take them each in turn so i'll start with the question for lisa but then sibi and malini for this one if there's anything that you'd like to add once lisa has finished then please do but i just ask you all to be mindful that we've got about 15 minutes left so we have to keep things you know reasonably concise if that's um if that's okay so the first question is from garima and that's um to lisa what what is your opinion on how policy narratives and programmatic priorities in turn affect people's own understandings of their needs and demands? Um, so it's a super question, Garima, and I'm pleased that I'm not answering it. Over to you, Lisa. Yeah, great question, difficult question. So multiple levels. I mean, certainly, in terms of programmatic um, implications for those of us who have worked in the development sector and aid industries, you know that these sorts of ideas and concepts trickle through from the top of the aid chain all the way down to the bottom in terms of what is uh, enabled and people in turn will frame their problems in ways that are uh, uh, likely to receive support and. So that's one dynamic and I could talk about that for a long time. There's a claim making process and that's related to the first. And so I think that sometimes with, as researchers, we, or as reporters, we may take what people say at face value, but we have to be really cautious about that. I don't know what just up our, our drawings um, because we have to recognize that people are making claims, are telling stories about the realities that they see, but they're also advancing certain claims to resources, to knowledge, to history, to uh, uh, ways of seeing the world. And so it's that balance between, yes, we want to have the voices heard, but you know, not, not all is immediately truth. And that is even more so because people are implicated in these processes of representational construction. And so we're all reading the same media um, or different media in the case of social media, perhaps, but we're, we're, we're internalizing some of those concepts. And so some of the people with whom we work are, are very, very clear that one needs some sort of structured, sustain, sustained conversational dialogic process, almost a Freirean process, to help people understand their own needs, aspirations, understandings, and reactions. And that, that sometimes, or, and others are looking at, at sort of underlying core stories. What is it when we start to listen to the different stories we can unpack? So it's, complicated. Um, um, uh, so I'm going to stop there because I don't have a lot of time. Um, but it does mean that there are techniques um, to, to try and move beyond the surface, to move beyond, beyond the claim making and probe more deeply and help people to articulate for themselves some of those uh, um, core frames, needs, hopes, etc. That's uh, that's super. Thanks very much, Lisa. Um, Sibi Bellino, is there anything that you'd like to add at this point? No, I think I'm good. Thanks. Malini is possibly just uh, struggling with her internet. So I think um, I'll come to the uh, I'll come to the okay. question. Oh. Are you back, Malini? Yes, I'm back, sorry. That's okay. Was there anything that you just wanted to, to add to the question that Lisa just responded to? Uh, all right. Sure, of course. Um, I was, there was a lag when Lisa was speaking, so I'm just going to take the question. It says, what is your opinion on how policy narratives in turn affect people's own understanding? I think there is a huge uh, impact that these narratives have on people's own sense of their needs and demands for sure, because uh, 
I think for a large section of people impacted by disasters, I think they often do not find the vocabulary to even express what's going on or what is most needed, right? To the extent that they start internalizing a lot of these frames that are thrown out by the media, right? So I think, which is why, and which is why I mentioned right at the onset of the discussion about how I think media plays such an important role in discourse building, right? And this discourse is not just for people in, just not just for the aid givers, but, but, but for beneficiaries as well, because there's a way in which you start imagining yourself to be uh, what these narratives are projecting you to be, right? Uh, the more vulnerable than the others. Uh, so just to give you a quick example and I'll stop. So my father who's been a victim of the South Asian partition, for instance, right? you know, draws on some of these tropes that exist out there, you know, about vulnerability, about who was at fault, who was more vulnerable. And over the years, I've seen him internalizing these tropes to the extent that he actually feels that, you know, of all the people, of, of all the other victims who suffered, his suffering was obviously more, right? So it's just one example to demonstrate perhaps how narratives have such an important psychological uh, effect on beneficiaries. Super. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Malini. And I think, yeah, I think that process by which people often internalise the uh, the discourse that, that's moving around is uh, is a point well made. Okay. So, Sibi, this is a uh, this is for you, and this is from Chan Ni Singh. Um, what can be done to incentivize a shift in media coverage from reactive event-based reporting to more long-term coverage before, during, and after events? And also moving from, I guess, more exclusively covering relief to looking at longer-term recovery. So I think this is picking up on a, on a point you made, I think, midway through. Uh, it was just about, the, I guess, the, the tendency that the media have to, to focus on certain elements of a disaster rather than taking that longer term view yeah so um, i think it's not so much a shift that is needed but also a addition that is the need of the hour i think uh, you know like um, event based reporting is extremely important everyone needs to know what is happening in the immediate aftermath but uh, the problem is that it doesn't continue into you know prolonged reporting and other aspects are not covered as much as they should I think there should be encouragement and interventions made which facilitate prolonged uh, coverage of environment, climate change, and other related issues in mainstream media as well as alternative media. And good journalists who are well aware of these issues, who have experience in reporting on these issues, should be present in these organizations or be part of the initiatives so that they and offer the space to do this reporting and also allocate stories to these colleagues, to their colleagues and uh, tell the editors how these issues can be linked to other, other important uh, agendas that the newspaper or media houses pursue. Uh, these can be like, you know, like I don't think uh, they should like, it needn't be like, like one dedicated space every day, but there can be like shows on say broadcast media or columns in digital media or newspapers, or even in, and, uh, you know, like other kind of forum where there's a dedicated space essentially for coverage related to these events and about disasters and recovery. And this, will, this has to be a slow process, but there's definitely a good audience, I think, for this kind of, uh, you know, media reporting. Also in the Indian context, I think uh, the regional language media, at least those that I'm familiar with, which is uh, Tamil media, primarily, there is like a complete lack of expertise in terms of covering disasters, climate change, environment, etc. So. so there's a desperate need for talent to be developed so that the regional language media is also better, uh, in a better position to cover these issues in the short term or the long term. So I hope this answers the question. Super, that's uh, that's great. Thank you very much, Sibi. And uh, seeing as we are, we're kind of, yeah, we don't have that long left. So if um, we've got three three questions to go. So if I just um, pose all three questions and then I'll come to each of you in turn and you can 
pick up on uh, an element of any one of those three questions as you like. Um, so Roger, uh, he was uh, asking around um, this kind of, uh, there's a huge range of narratives that are circulating on social media um, and how they relate to more conventional forms of news media. And is it possibly the case that certain narratives only come to more mainstream attention once they get reported through, I guess, more mainstream newspapers and broadcast media? And then I guess, relatedly, have you any examples to share of cases where media representations of disaster impact or recovery have been starkly different from how disaster affected people have sought to portray their own needs, aspirations or priorities? So that's, I guess, a, a linked question there. And then a question from uh, Mohit Yadav, uh, which is directed towards Validi and Lisa. Um, how can how can it be under how can be understood government aiding scheme politics and the reality of getting or reaching aid to affected people in both monetary and logistical terms? Um, so, uh, Lisa, is all right if I come to you first, and then I'll uh, <laughs> then I'll <laughs> I'll come come to Malini and then to to Sibi. Um, uh, yeah, as, yeah. Uh, oh, oh, over to you, Lisa. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, these are these are great questions. Um, tough questions. I have lots of cases where dominant meta narratives and representations of disaster and recovery are starkly different from those of disaster affected um, people, and I encourage you to look up the word adapto and Montreal, and you'll get to our Uver de Rabla webpage where we have all sorts of videos and project documentation. Um, I'll try and put the link in the chat, but I'm not sure I'll be able to. Um, and uh, those are very, very rich in the sense that they allow people to speak for themselves about their aspirations and to focus on the images that were important to them. So I, 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 I think that, that yes, absolutely. Um, all sorts of different things from the causes to the impacts and what matters to what kinds of disasters and risks and uncertainties are most important. All of those come through and also to, to the importance of, I mean, one thing that we haven't talked about it, I think, uh, I think Lini referred to it a little bit is that, you know, there's all sorts of processes of exclusion and discrimination at the local level that also come into play. And so, you know, one of, one of the tensions, and, and maybe this will speak to some of, of these questions, I'm not quite sure, um, is we're funded by the IDRC, uh, a Canadian research government institution. And they're saying, we want you to scale up. We want the initiatives that you've been involved in to be made more visible. And we're saying, well, we can make things more visible, but certain dynamics can't be made more visible. For example, we have lots of women leaders of change on the ground and they have come to us and said, we're happy to keep acting but if we're made visible, our lives are in danger. We're going to, to receive pushback or violence from our husbands, fathers, brothers, or wider community. So these types of tensions, I, I think that what makes it into the media, what needs to be outside, what needs to be in the spotlight, what you know isn't, those, those are locally situated and um, have to be context specific and have to be attentive to the political dimensions. These, these media representations are all political. Um, so we can say media needs to be advocacy, um, but only in certain moments. So I don't know that this directly pertained, but it, it's my closing bit. Well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Lisa. Um, Malini, over to you. 
Yeah, I, I just want to take a moment to congratulate the team behind this fantastic graffiti. It's, it's looking so good and it's so creatively done. Thank you. Uh, can I just respond to uh, Roger's question, if that's all right, Mark, on the social media? Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, I, I just want to clarify that I don't want to give the impression that social media could ever be an alternative to mainstream media, right? That's not the idea. But, uh, but what I'm definitely making a case for is the idea that these kinds of spaces, which are very new, right? These kinds of spaces never existed perhaps 20 years back or maybe 25 years ago. Uh, they are, you know, interactive. And, and the idea is not whether these are circulating truths or untruths. For me, the very fact that these are interesting processes by which people get to communicate with each other and get an opportunity to rupture some of these meta narratives that are floating around uh, is a very encouraging sign, right? So to invoke Habermas, the whole idea of communicative rationality entrusts, uh, you know, a places tr enormous trust on the process, not so much on the outcome, right? Uh, social media to me is populated by a multiplicity of all kinds of characters, right? And it's of course a fact that you have political parties now with their own PR cells, you know, who have started populating these places. But at the same time, just the fact that there are multiplicity of opinions and multiple truths that are being brought to the fore, I think is a very welcome uh, democratic, uh, you know, change to the process of narrative setting, right? So even if you have dominant narratives out there, and you have just a very minuscule percentage challenging that, uh, that still gives people an opportunity to ponder over it and to reflect and, you know, give them perhaps a new idea to dwell on. And that I think is a very powerful uh, impact of social media. Lovely, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Malini. And then Sibi, the last word to you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mark. It's always nice to have the last word. Uh, thank you so much for having me, by the way. It was really great to be a part of this session. Uh, I would also actually just quickly like to talk about the question related to social media. So I just wanted to add to what Malni said, and I think the, wall, the boundaries are extremely blurred between legacy and social media. And legacy media is producing content meant primarily for certain social media, for example. So like we really don't know where one ends and another begins. So the bubble also is expanding based on your politics, like your legacy media, if you're reading a particular legacy media because of your political ideology or meaning you're accessing certain social media. So the bubble is expanding to include legacy media as well, while the boundaries between various forms of media, I think are blurring extremely so like, so that is something I find interesting and something that we can all think about. And in terms of examples where media representation is starkly different, I think for literally every disaster, at least in India, what those affected need or the perspective that they have is almost inevitably different from what is portrayed in the media. So yeah, it'll just be like too much to go into where I think we are out of time as well right now. So, but yeah, that's definitely something. Thank you so much again. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Sibi. And um, well, I was going to, um, yeah, do, I mean, it's, it's time to wrap up. So I'd like to express my, my deepest and sincerest thanks to you, Sibi, and to you, Lisa, and to you, uh, Malini. I mean, thank you for sharing your insights. Thank you for your thank you for your time. I mean, I've very much enjoyed, uh, you know, I've really enjoyed the session. It's been really great to kind of talk about these um, these issues. I would just like to draw everyone's attention to the uh, to Rajasay's work, who's been beavering away in the background, and I think she has done certainly will do a much better job of summarising the session than I could ever do. Uh, not only that, but She's done it in a very beautiful way. Um, apart from me, I look terrible. <laughs> anyway, 
Well, anyway, I, I don't hold that against you, Radice. I think uh, I think you've done a wonderful job. So thank you, thank you very much. I think it'd be a really lovely record of the um, really lovely record of the of the session. So I think I shall. We're slightly over time, so I'm not going to I'm not going to prattle on. I'll bring it to a close. But just to um, urge everyone, if you're interested in anything that's been discussed, please feel free to follow up directly with Sibi, Lisa, or Malini. Um, similarly, if there's stuff about the project that you're interested in, then do check out our project website, which also has contact details of everybody that's been involved in the project as well. And we're very happy to take your take your questions or to kind of enter into further discussions with you. So I should just finish by giving you all a clap. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone Excellent. for thank you everyone for listening. Um